Thank you very much, Jonathan. And of course, one of my other roles is president of the Gardner Foundation. And so I am in this uh, unusual situation where Jonathan has given the introduction to the Gardner Foundation that I would normally be giving. Uh, so thank you, Jonathan, for doing that. It's a pleasure to be here representing the Gardner Foundation, but also as a Gardner awardee to give this year's Gardner Award lecture at McMaster University. McMaster, where in fact I was on uh, adjunct faculty for several years when I was at Brock University. So I have close ongoing connections with McMaster University. So I am going to share my screen now. So let me do that and uh, find my presentation for you. And we will get going. Minute. Okay. There. So, what I'm going to do today is to talk about my science and, and the, which has already been mentioned, my interest, my long standing interest in the early mouse embryo. And I'm going to try to sort of give you a quick overview of some of the many different aspects of mouse development that we've studied over the years, but focus particularly on early mouse development, how the embryo forms, how stem cells form, and then at the end, just to sort of set it in a broader context, I'm going to talk a little bit about how whenever you start working on mouse embryos, you can't avoid the discussion of the what if we were to study these things in the human embryo and some of the political, legal, and ethical concerns that arise with that, that I have also been involved with over the years. So let's begin. And let's begin with the blastocyst, which is shown here in the background, my favorite stage of development. Uh, and the blastocyst, the mouse blastocyst, give rise, give rise to all the cell types of the developing embryo, of course. But the blastocyst itself, in the mouse, it's about 100 microns in diameter, size of a speck of dust, 100 cells, the picture here is just before the embryo is going to implant in the uterus, and it's formed only three cell types. The outer cells are called the trophectoderm. They go on to form the trophoblast layers of the placenta. The inside cells, this group of cells called the inner cell mass, divided up at this point into a layer on the outside called primitive endoderm, which gives rise to endoderm of the yolk sac. And it's this little group of cells here, the epiblast, that are stained pink because they're stained with an antibody to OCT4, which is a famous pluripotency factor. But basically, these are the cells that give rise to the entire fetus. So it is the epiblast cells that are the pluripotent cells of the embryo. And that will obviously come back later on as we talk about stem cells. So over my career, there are a number of questions that we've tried to address with different tools at different stages in the development of the technologies. But overall, we keep coming back to these with more and more precision. First question is, when do cells get committed to, this, to these lineages? They're clearly a present and uh, expressing specific genes by the blastocyst. Can they change fate? When does fate get established? How do the, what are the signaling pathways and genetic uh, controls that lead to the separation of these three cell fates? Can we actually generate stem cells that are equivalent to the three lineages? And then our most recent question, which we certainly haven't solved, is could we actually generate not lineage-specific stem cells, but totipotent stem cells? So let's think a little bit more about what happens leading up to the blastocyst stage. And essentially what we know from experiments from my lab, many other labs over the years, is that we start with a totipotent cell. And totipotency means they can make all those cells, placenta, extra embryonic tissues, and the fetus itself. Obviously, the zygote does that. But individual cells at the two-cell stage can also do that. And even at the eight-cell stage, a single blastomere, when aggregated with other cells, can make all three cell types of the blastocyst and make a chimera with mix, mixtures of those cells. However, morphologically and by uh, experimentally, as we go from this eight cell stage through to the blastocyst, cells start to become sticking together more. They start to become polarized on the outside. 
we generate clearly a polarized epithelium and an enclosed cells. And by the 64 cell blastocyst, cells become restricted to cell fate. But it's a gradual process. We also know, and I'm not going to show you the data, that the trophectoderm is actually restricted before the inside cells. And that's probably coincident with its polarity, uh, as we'll see in a minute. By the time you get to this stage, you can't change cell fate. You can turn cells inside out, upside down, they are restricted. Prior to that stage, it's a gradual process. So in that gradual process, over the years, it's become apparent that morphology is really, really important. And there are morphological changes that accompany this gradual restriction of cell fate and gene expression. The first event is this event of compaction at the eight cell stage, where cells become closely adherent, driven by E cadherin. They start to become polarized, and all your favorite cell polarity factors become localized, apical and basal in these cells. And then as they divide, essentially, although there's a lot of shuffling going on, you end up with the outer polarized cells making a tight junction coupled epithelium, enclosing then a group of cells that are going to go on and form the inner cell mass. And that process, during that process, we can map gene expression of some of the lineage-specific genes in association with these morphological events. So CDS2, which is our, my favorite gene, is the gene that's a transcription factor absolutely required to specify trophectoderm fate. So by the blastocyst, it's expressed in all the outside cells. But if you look earlier than that, it kind of comes on randomly during this process and then only gradually gets restricted to the outside cells. So this suggests then that this gene expression pattern is somehow related to morphology, to cell adhesion, cell polarity, and cell position. So for many years, we kept asking ourselves, okay, that's fine, we, that's what we see, but is there a signaling pathway that could, that could actually stabilize cell fate downstream of these morphology events of adhesion, polarity, and position? And the answer came about, of course, with the HIPPO signaling pathway. And our first clue that HIPPO might be involved came when Amy Ralston was still a postdoc in the lab and in a collaboration with Hiro Suzaki's lab in Japan, where we noticed that when you look at uh, YAP, which is a co-activator of T transcription factors and is known to be downstream of HIPPO signaling, then this YAP coactivator, which we were looking at for reasons that I don't need to explain, but turns out to be fortuitous, when we looked with antibodies to YAP, what Amy noticed was, of course, that YAP was expressed throughout pre-implantation development. But as the cell started to form inside and outside environments, then YAP became highly nuclear localized in the outside cells and excluded from the nuclei in the inside cells. And if you overlay that with that sort of a developing pattern of CDX2 that I just showed you, you see that they overlie almost completely. So YAP nuclear localization correlated with CDX2 expression in the nucleus as well. And a lot of experiments by uh, Hero's lab and by many other labs have suggested that indeed YAP is a key player in this specification and that it is being controlled as it is in many other cell types by components of the HIPPO signaling pathway. Now, HIPPO signaling has been, was identified as a growth control pathway in Drosophila and then in mammalian cells, highly conserved. And it's, it's, and it's really controlling uh, cell, behavior, cell growth and cell proliferation. Many of the components of this are tumor suppressor genes. But it's known that there's a complex at the cell that has to be at the cell membrane that contains this serine threonine kinase called LATS2, that when in collaboration with angiomotin, merlin, and also in association with cell adhesion, this complex activates the serine threonine kinase, phosphorylates YAP. And when YAP is phosphorylated and this pathway is active, it stays out of the nucleus. Therefore, it can't interact with the T transcription factors and activate downstream transcription. So this has been shown in mammalian cells, it's also true in Drosophila, and what has been shown from a number of labs is that in fact, these components are also important for controlling YAP localization in the mammalian embryo. And here's just an example from my lab. We looked at NF2, which is the Merlin equivalent in mammalian cells, 
neurofibromatosis too. It's a, it's a component of this lax kinase of the cell membrane. And if you knock it out, and you have to take it out maternally and zygotically, as Katie Coburn showed in the lab, because it's inherited maternally, but if you have a mouse embryo that lacks NF2 in, the, uh, in all cells from the mother and from the zygote, then you make something that looks like a blastocyst, so it's not really affecting the morphology, but that blastocyst is very confused because in all the inside cells, as well as the outside cells, YAP is in the nucleus. And associated with that, CDH2 gets localized in the inside cells as well. So what you've done is by stopping the activity of the serine threonine kinase and phosphorylating YAP, you've basically turned all the cells into trophectoderm. This blastocyst goes on and makes a sort of trophectoderm mess. It will implant, but it can't go any further. And this is true of other components of the pathway. We now have a pretty good model from these and other studies that works a little like this. It says that as cells become uh, localized and polarized on the outside, then polar, polar cells localize some components of this complex to the apical domain so that, yet, so that the complex and lax kinase is not active. YAP can enter the nucleus and activate CDX2. In the inside cells, without the polarity, this complex is at the cell membrane, LATS is active, YAP is phosphorylated, and you don't activate the trophoblast. In fact, you activate the inner cell mass pathway. So we now, there's lots more details and ongoing studies, but this is basically the way we think the first decision is made. It's related to cell polarity, cell position, mechanical tension is involved. All of this is regulating YAP localization and starting the difference between inner cell mass and trophectoderm. Now, interestingly, and we'll come back to this in a, a little later, recently, Kathy Nyakon's lab has shown that in human embryos, where we know that things are somewhat the same and somewhat different, they've also investigated the role of HIPPO-YAP, and they find that it's conserved. It seems to be also involved in the human in specifying trophectic and fate. So this is a conserved and important pathway. But that's only one cell lineage. You've made the trophectoderm, but you've still got the inside cells of the inner cell mass that have to go on and make another lineage decision to make epiblast and primitive endoderm. So how does that happen? So not the same way. Because if we look at the blastocyst, as, we show, as, as I showed you the pretty picture earlier on, here it is at four and a half days, and here is a segregation between the epiblast and the primitive endoderm. It looks as though that could be another positional dependent event, right? The cells, the cells on the surface get a signal to make primitive endoderm, the enclosed cells go on to form epiblast. And that's the way I always thought it was. It's the way I published um, uh, many, many papers on that in the early days, because I did some experiments that supported that. And it's always good to disprove your own hypotheses, because uh, Claire Scherzer, when she was in the lab, started to look at some of the genes that we know are important for primitive endoderm and epiblast and ask whether they show positional dependent expression early on. And the answer is absolutely not. If you look in the inner cell mass before this segregation of the lineages occur, then you get this kind of mosaic picture. GATA6 is a primitive endoderm marker. NANOG is an epiblast marker. And you can see you've got a mixture of cells that are positive for one or the other or double positive for both of them. So somehow you're getting this heterogeneous expression which then resolves and the cells separate over time. A different mechanism somehow must be involved. So in order to really get a better picture of this and indeed all of the processes of early development, we'd really like to get away from the nice static images, the pretty static images that I've just shown you, and start to really look at gene expression in the living embryo as cells become specialized. To do this, we obviously need improved single cell analysis and single cell RNA-seq has been, and we've applied and others have applied and shown this gradual segregation during early development. But we'd like to take some of these markers that, that are involved in specifying cell fate and really tag those genes and mod, um, mod, um, watch what that happens during these processes of cell differentiation. So we really need to fluorescently tag endogenous genes, mostly as fusions, so we can really watch what the protein is doing. And we can do that, and people have done a few of those, 
but using traditional mouse genetics, it's been slow and painful. And every time I would get a new postdoc into the lab, and I'd say, you know, what we really need to do is to tag more genes so we can do all these pretty imaging. And they go, oh, that's a lot of work. We've got to make targeted ES cells and make chimeras, and we'll take a year, and then we find it didn't work. So they would all sort of um, hide in a corner and hope, hope that I wouldn't ask them again. But, of course, that all changed when CRISPR came and CRISPR to the, to the rescue. So CRISPR has changed everything that we do in terms of mouse genetics. So all the work that my lab and many labs have done over the years in gene targeting ES cells is not a complete waste of time, but certainly CRISPR, which we can do directly in embryos, has made it so much faster and more efficient that it's changed our ability to think about making many, many lines, and that is what's been going on. So as president of Gardner Foundation, it was my privilege to rec recognize at the gala in, in 2016, what I call the CRISPR quintet in the middle here. You'll, know, you'll recognize some other people here as well, Tony Fauci and Frank Plummer. This is Lauren Tyrell, who's the, ch who's the chair of the board at the time. Um, and you'll notice particularly, this is Fong Zhang, but you'll notice uh, Emmanuel and Jennifer, Rodolf Barangu and Philip Horba, they, who developed the bacterial immunity. And of course, Jennifer and, and uh, Emmanuel just won the Nobel Prize this week. So thanks to them, we can actually start really doing genetics in the mouse embryo efficiently. But even so, doing, introducing the CRISPR components into a zygote and getting tagged genes and complex alterations turns out not to be terribly easy until Bin Gu and Esther Postvi, postdocs in my lab at the time, had a brainwave and realized that instead of introducing all the components into the zygote, which is what most people would do, um, they realized that if they introduced the CRISPR components, the guide RNA and the enzyme, into the two cell stage, they'd have a much better chance of getting homologous recombination, which was needed to develop these fluorescent tag genes. And so that's because at the two cell stage, there's a very long G2, so, which is when homologous recombination can occur. So it really worked, and now they're able to generate efficiencies of between 50 and 100%. At one go, in one experiment, you can generate multiple different lines. And in six months, they generated 20 lines, and Bin has continued to generate more and more ever since, and this has been shared with people around the world. I'll just show you a video because it's fun. People often ask, two cell, how do you do it? Well, you inject one cell, now you've got to spin it around, and inject the other cell. People say, well, it's too difficult. Why don't you just inject one blastomere? If you inject both, you double your chances of getting the, in the insertion you want. So that's the way it goes. And now we can watch these processes. Here's the inner cell mass and trophectoderm. We're seeing CDX2 in green and SOX2 in red. And as we would predict, it really is related to cell position, you don't get a mixture, you really get the outside cells increasing CDX2 and then SOX2 comes on as CDX2 goes down. So let's look at the GATA6 primitive endoderm and NANOG, which is a pluripotent marker, and ask what's happening. This is a lot more complex. In fact, I still don't know how to deconvolve what's going on here. This is not a simple segregation. It ends up with nano in the inside of the inner cell mass and, and uh, guard on the outside, but it's certainly not straightforward. So this requires more work. But what we do know is that what is key to that separation and the specification of primitive endoderm and epiblast is FGF signaling. So it's not HIPPO, it's FGF. And we know that from experiments in my lab and other labs again over the years, in which if you block FGF work signaling in the early blastocyst, as the inner cell mass is undergoing this sort of mosaic expression, if you block ERK signaling, then every cell becomes epiblast. And this is shown on the left, where you've got uh, nanog in the, all the cells. And on the right, if you activate ERK signaling, then every cell becomes primitive endoderm. So it's a really system where individual cells are reading out local FGF signals. We do not fully understand how that occurs, um, but there's a lot more research going on on that right now. But it's very clear that FGF is the key component. So if you think about it then, summarizing lots of work over many years, 
to Salvinia's decisions, and they're kind of different, which is nice to think about how embryos use different ways of making linear decisions. The first one in a cell mass trophectoderm is clearly position dependent. It's dependent on hippo signaling. Uh, it actually uses FGF to, for trophoblast proliferation, which I didn't say, so FGF has a role there. But, and this pathway is conserved in humans, at least the hippo uh, inner cell mass trophectoderm segregation is. The epiblast primitive endoderm segregation is, requires stochastic, that means we don't understand, activation of, cell, of FGF signaling followed by cell sorting. So cells with high FGF stay epiblast, cells with, uh, so go to the primitive endoderm, cells with low FGF stay as epiblast. This pathway is not conserved in humans. So experiments in humans suggest this is not involved in that linear decision, which does occur in humans, but not dependent on FGF. However, what we do know is that FGF signaling is a key component to our ability in the mouse to generate three stem cell types from the mouse blastocyst. Um, and this is uh, kind of an, uh, really another area where I've put a lot of effort over many years to try to see if we could generate cell lines that would get away from the small number of cells in the blastocyst. So we could really study some of the, in the molecular pathways involved in establishing and maintaining cell fate by having cell types from the blastocyst itself. And of course, ES cells, have, we did not derive. We certainly worked on them extensively. Actually, we tried to derive them years ago and failed. Uh, but uh, as we know, other people succeeded. And ES cells come from the epiblast. So they have the pluripotent properties that we'd shown the epiblast or the embryo has. That is just, and when you put them back into a blastocyst, then they contribute to all the cells of the fetus, blue cells here, not to the yolk sac and not to the placenta. So they are pluripotent, not totipotent. They reflect the lineage restriction, which we had shown occurred in the blastocyst. And then we drive TS cells from the trophoblast cells. They require FGF signaling, they proliferate indefinitely in culture, they have express the trophoblast transcription factors, put them back in the blastocyst, and they contribute to the placenta, but not to the fetus. And then finally, Zen cells from the primitive endoderm, different cell type, they express the transcription factors. In a chimera, they contribute to the yolk cell. So a very nice system where we've got the three cell types that we have. And we've used them a lot, and other people have used them a lot to study uh, the molecular pathways and other properties of these cells in culture. Once we made all those three cell types, people would often ask me at the end of a, a lecture, and you might have already written that question, I don't know, well, what happens if you take all those three stem cells and instead of testing them in chimeras, what happens if you put them back together? Can they regenerate an embryo, a complete embryo with, with all the three cell layers? And we tried various forms of that, but we never pushed it very hard. I think partly because I was a little concerned about what we might be generating. But more recently, uh, labs have started to do exactly that. So Magda Zernich at Goetz's lab in the UK has made what they call ETX uh, embryos, where they took ES cells and RTS and Zen cells, dissociated them and recombined them and showed that they will sort themselves out to form something like this, this is actually the ETX. This is a normal five and a half day embryo just after implantation. This is the epiblast, this is the trophoblast, and the, on the outside is the primitive endoderm. So one of these is the embryoid and one of them is the embryo. It's very hard to tell which is which. Of course, this is a selected image, but still it's quite impressive. So it's not a perfect model, but it's a really interesting one, but it's modeling post-implantation development. Nicola Rivron's lab has recently done a very neat series of experiments, a very controlled series of experiments, in which they were able to make what he calls blastoids, which mimic the earlier stage of blastocyst by combining ES cells, which they put in these little micro wells as clumps, and then sprinkling TS cells on top of them, such that they re-aggregate with the TS cells on the outside and closing the uh, ES cells, and then go on and form these structures that you know, when you have a little set of them, they look remarkably similar to blastocysts and they have some of the same expression patterns and really many of the properties. So this is really a new way of analyzing development and being able to, to put different cell types together, genetically manipulate one cell type and the other. And also, of course, you can do it on a large scale and think about doing screens. But 
in the mouse, I would argue, you know, we have embryos and we can do so much at a small scale now with single cell analysis, but I'm not so convinced that these embryo models are going to be incredibly uh, important going forward. However, uh, once those um, embryos started to be published and the, uh, picked up by the press and by other groups, people started to make worry, what are we doing here? Uh, in the mouse, are we regenerating a mouse embryo that could have organismic potential, could go on and form a mouse from stem cells? And that would be worrying enough. But of course, if you did this with human cells, would the emergent properties that you see in these stem cell-based models challenge essentially what it means to have human organismic potential? What would be the ethical and legal ramifications of generating human organized embryos. And that is something that is still under discussion. This is one of, one of the commentaries, and I've certainly been involved in these. We'll come back to that in a minute. So, a bit worrying, but perhaps not quite so worrying at the moment because both the ETX and the blastoids have been transferred back into the mouse uterus. And they will cause a decidual response, that is to say, they begin the implantation process, presumably because the trophoblast cells that they have are enough to sort of initiate that decidual response, but they really don't develop into embryos. The ongoing interactions between the embryo lineages and the extra embryonic lineages that are required for normal development to occur are just not occurring. So they're not yet true models of early development. Number of reasons for that. One of them is almost certainly that although I said we can generate stem cells from the blastocyst, uh, ES cells themselves, without changing the FGF environment, are more equivalent to sort of later epiblast. And TS cells and Zen cells also may be more equivalent to the early post-implantation peripherative cells rather than the initial cells, the, the trophector down of the blastocyst. So you probably need to get stem cells to be more like the blastocyst itself. And people are certainly working on that and there's some indication that you may be able to shift those cells closer to the blastocyst. Then maybe in the mouth you would be able to regenerate a truly functional blastocyst. But maybe we need to go back even earlier. So these cells at the blastocyst stage are obviously lineage committed can we capture the earlier stage, the totipotent state, and really capture totipotency and be able to generate embryos from totipotent stem cells? So that's been something that has captured my imagination, my lab's imagination, and we're still imagining because we haven't achieved, but it's also captured the imagination of a number of different labs around the world. Um, and in the last little while, there have been a number of reports, and I'm going to just focus on the, the perhaps ones that I think are more important here, a number of reports suggesting that in the mouse, maybe in the human, but certainly in the mouse, it is possible to derive stem cells that have a more totipotent uh, um, properties. So we have to go back to the embryo to think about what that would be and what those cells, what properties those cells should have. So remember the zygote is totipotent, two cell clearly still totipotent, um, at the eight cell, and uh, even at the 16 cell stage, our studies have shown that cells can still change fate. They may be progressing down the pathway to the blastocyst, but experimentally they're not fully restricted. So it may not be totipotent, but they certainly do have properties that suggest if you could capture that, you'd have a cell type that could make all the cell types of the blastocyst. So several years ago, people have reported on these cells that occur in embryonic stem cell cultures, which are called 2C-like cells. And they have many of the genetic and gene expression properties of the two-cell embryo. However, they are not stable cell lines. You cannot maintain them and you cannot make really functional chimeras or anything else with them. So they're an interesting cell type. We could talk about it if anybody's interested. More importantly, it was a couple of papers from uh, Hong Kui Deng's lab uh, and uh, Pentao Liu's lab, both confusingly, with a, the first author being Yang, different Yangs, um, in Cell and in Nature, suggesting that they could take ES cells or embryos 
and derive what they called extended or expanded potential cells that had more capacity to generate trophoblasts than would the embryonic stem cell that we're most used, used to. And then, of course, in the blastocyst, I've already told you that we have lineage restricted cells. So we have been looking and interested in trying to capture this totipotent state. We think that the four to eight cell stage is where we should go, and we're still working on that. But before we started to make our own attempts at totipotent cells, we thought we should generate some criteria of what the properties of such a cell would be. And I, when I say we here, this has been a wonderful collaboration, an international collaboration uh, with Esther Postvai, ex-postdoc, who's uh, now at Princeton, uh, with Frederick Lanner, another ex-postdoc, who's on faculty at Karolinska Institute, and Vincent Pasquet at uh, KU Leuven in, in Belgium, and members of their lab and members of my lab. It's been a wonderful, complicated uh, cross-border collaboration. But what we decided to do was talk to test the existing EPSCs, the DENG and the LU cells that have been generated against what we consider the required properties for a totipotent state. And here are the required properties. The expression profile of those cells should reflect pre-blastocyst stages, should look like those totipotent cells. Cell lines should be stable. We can proliferate them, maintain them, so if we know genetically and epigenetically, we should be able to freeze them, thaw them, play with them. If they're really totipotent, they should be able to go on and form both ES cells and TS cells in vitro. And most importantly, in the mouse, if they're truly totipotent, then like a blastomere from an early embryo, they should contribute robustly, major contributions to both trophoblast and epiblast lineages and chimeras. I'm not gonna show you the data, but basically, in this, and you can look up the study, it's on bioarchive and it should be out soon, Nature Cell Biology, essentially, what we find is that the EPSCs don't fully meet any of these criteria. Their expression profile is different from the uh, ES cells, but it's not, and it picks up some early gene expression patterns, but not completely. So they have a different profile altogether. They are stable, so that's good. Um, they, are, they can generate ES cells quite readily, so they can go forward and make ES cells. And they can make TS cells, but not very efficiently. And in chimeras, although we see contributions occasionally to the trophoblast lineage, it's very small contributions. And importantly, when you look at the cells, they are not expressing trophoblast markers. So it seems that the EPSCs, although they contribute extensively to the embryo, they may have some altered cell surface properties that allows them to go out into other lineages but they're not able to contribute functionally to those lineages. So we don't think that they're there yet. So they do have some interesting differences from naive pluripotent cells, but they don't fulfill all our criteria. So I would say the search for a totipotent stem cell continues. And there are more studies coming out in the literature and certainly my lab and the other lab, uh, my collaborative labs are still after seeing whether we can capture this state in a better way. So that is, a summary of my career with the mouse blastocyst. And when you work with the mouse, you're in a quiet research lab doing your own research, and uh, you know it's interesting and fascinating, and you know that it has implications for humans because that's why you do it. You don't just do it to find out about the mouse. You are thinking about applications and transfer into the human system. But it does mean that once a finding comes out of the mouse lab, and people start doing it uh, in uh, human systems as well, then it gets much more controversial. You get into a lot of public debate, ethical, legal, regulatory, political debates uh, in this area. And uh, it's interesting when you look back over time and look at all the controversies that have been associated with various aspects of human embryo research. In every case, the work that's, that's behind these human discoveries and human experiments began in the mouse. The only exception to that one would be the second one on my list, which is Dolly the sheep, but it didn't. That, so cloning succeeded first in sheep, not in the mouse, did later on could be done in the mouse. But again, it's a non-human system. So experimental systems are what was translated. 
So let's look at the timeline and I'll just tell you, I've been involved in some of the ethical and regulatory debates around all of these. And of course, I've also been involved to some degree in the mouse work that lies behind them. The first IVF baby was born in 1978. I left uh, the UK in 1977 from the lab where Bob Edwards was working on in vitro fertilization in human embryos. So I was very much aware of the controversies and the background to that discovery. And it was incredibly controversial at the time, incredibly controversial, test tube babies, horror, horror. And of course, IVF is now a well-accepted form of reproductive technologies. Over 1% of children in North America are born by IVF. Then we go on, we go on to uh, uh, cloning, Dolly the sheep. Um, what happens if you go not in sheep, but start thinking about cloning humans and reproductive cloning. You may remember the sort of the, uh, uh, controversies around the Raelians claiming to have cloned humans. Um, so, uh, but again, some reasons to do nuclear transfer to study reprogramming. Then mouse ES cells have been around for a long time. First human ES cells, 1998, derived from human embryos, excess embryos from IVF programs. Very controversial in, air, in jurisdictions where working with embryos at all was considered to be unacceptable. Human iPS cells kind of changed some of that controversy because now you could make pluripotent cells without uh, having to deal with an embryo. And then as we move forward, CRISPR-Cas9. I've just said how wonderful CRISPR is, how it's changed our lives in being able to rapidly generate genetically modified mice. Well, of course, if you can genetically modify mice rapidly and efficiently by injecting into the zygote, what would happen if we did it in humans? So the whole issue of germline editing becomes into play. Extended in vitro culture of blastocysts. There's something called the 14-day rule. It's been around for a long time, but uh, in many jurisdictions, including Canada, you're not allowed to culture a human embryo beyond 14 days. What if we did that in order to study and get better understanding of embryo development? Human pig chimera is not going to talk about. First gene edited baby, 2018, and then the ones I just told you about, blastoids, ETX, and gastroids in mouse, or patterns in human. So I'll just list the sort of the, the more recent ones that I think are challenging, are exciting because they are tools that are going to give us a better understanding of human development. And some of them have potential for real uh, clinical application. So improved human cult cultures of human embryos, should we extend the 14 day rule? Organized cultures of stem cells, these embryos that I just described, are they morally concerning? Interspecies chimeras, um, which have been proposed as a way of getting uh, organs, human organs in pigs or sheep, um, which organs, which species, what if we put uh, cells that could contribute to the brain, where do we draw the line? Uh, gene editing, preventing disease or design of babies, and then one you can ask me about if you like, but this is something that also has to be thought about. But I'm just going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the ethical concerns around these stem cell models. Um, and uh, I want to make clear that's too, in, important terminology here. So there are a number of model systems, which we call non-integrated stem cell based embryo models in which ES cells are used to generate specific parts of the embryo. So uh, Alfonso Martinez Arias's lab in mouse and human has generated what he calls gastroids, which make something that elongates and starts to form the uh, starts to form the the uh, an elongated structure that looks like the body axis, but it's only mesoderm. It doesn't have trophoblast. It's not an organized complete embryo. I already described to you in the mouse the integrated stem cell based embryo models. And as it says here, there aren't any published human examples yet, but we can expect that there will be. And of course, in the mouse, you have these structures, like this one here, that really does look quite like a mouse blastocyst. So this is an integrated model that has all the components that could go on and make a conceptus. So I'm part of an ISSCR, the International Society of Stem Cell Research Working Group, working on stem cell guidelines, revising the ISSCR guidelines. And we've been looking at these issues of the, uh, the ethical and, and uh, 
um, regulatory constraints around these stem cell based embryo models. And what we're proposing is that whether you're a non integrated or an integrated model, you should not translate, transfer any human stem cell based embryo model into a, certainly not into a human uterus, but not into an animal uterus either. So these should be in vitro only. And these integrated models should be subject to more rigorous review. They had to have a strong scientific rationale because the ethical issues of whether in fact they could be generating human embryos in a petri dish has to be considered and constraints placed on their culture. The constraints would include the length of time in culture uh, and it should be restricted to the time appropriate for the scientific question under study. And then it says, unless prohibited by law, because these are international guidelines and uh, different countries have different laws. If you look at the Canadian guidelines, we may find that these are going to be restricted in Canada as we go forward. So here we are, here's this list again. So that's one I'm involved with. Gene editing is another one that I've spent too much time talking about. Gene editing is great. We've developed tools to edit the mouse embryo very efficiently. So we're part of the problem, if you like. We've developed the tools that if translated to human would, would mean that we could do germline gene editing. So obviously gene editing is very important for somatic gene therapy, correcting disease in patients who have a disease in the right cells. But wouldn't it be nice if you could prevent disease and remove the bad gene in the zygote, in the embryo, and therefore the baby would never have the disease at all. So CRISPR-Cas9 germline gene editing has become a topic for very, very, very extensive ethical uh, and, dis and legal discussion. So this is the kind of image you find on the internet. Um, designer babies, here's the for baby, and you see various things that maybe we could do. We could uh, have a high IQ, we could have perfect pitch, we could make uh, a better athlete. That one I think is possible. We don't know enough about IQ right now to be able to do any of this. But you could also, there are some genes that you might want to modify to reduce disease risk. Is that applicable or is that an enhancement? Is that going a step too far? But then, of course, the main thing you might want to do is shown at the bottom, which I added to this, this Im image of the internet, which is to actually cure a, a serious genetic disease like cystic fibrosis or Huntington's, take out the bad gene and make sure that in future the, the babies do not inherit the bad gene. There are lots of practicalities around this, which I'm sure you all are going to ask me about and you know already. But given that it's out there and that the tools exist, there have been a number of discussions and working groups coming together of scientists, of patient groups, of ethicists and lawyers to discuss the ins and outs of whether and when human germline editing could ever be applied. The first big discussion was in 2015, that's me on the stage. Uh, with a couple of other uh, stem cell gene editors, Robert Yanish and Wang Wan Jinpai from China. And the, coming out of that was the conclusion that basically it would be irresponsible, was the word that was chosen there, to proceed with any germline editing because it's not safe. We don't know how, how efficient it can be and how many off-target effects can be avoided. Uh, and society has to really look at the proposed application. There has to be regulatory oversight. And they said at present, these criteria have not been met. That was followed up by an NAS working group that I was on that came out with a report that basically said the same thing. It said, it's not ready, it's not safe, we need regulatory oversight. Well, you know what? That was all true, but the regulatory oversight was really not in place, certainly not internationally, because, uh, a couple of years ago now, uh, uh, Dr. He from Japan, from China, sorry, Japan, <laughs> Dr. He from China claims to have produced twins in which he had gene edited mutations that would prevent HIV infection. That was not one of the uses of gene editing that the NAS guidelines suggested was appropriate because you don't need to do that to prevent HIV infection. And of course, this caused immediate outcry, including in China. His university called for an investigation. He was fired. Uh, and in fact, I think he spent some time in prison. So because he broke all the ethical guidelines in China. So 
This then caused another round of discussions and another working group, which has just finished um, on heritable genome editing from the NAS and the uh, Royal Society in London, which basically was asked to, to lay out a, a, a pathway by which you would one day maybe do clinical genome editing in human embryos. And I was on the oversight committee for this, which was interesting to see how the commission worked and how we could bring it to a, a point where everybody would agree into a consensus document because it wasn't so easy. But the bottom line out of this one is I don't think anything's changed since 2015 because the overall conclusion is just the same, that we, it's not safe, the efficacy is still not clear, off-target event, events still are worry, uh, and there are other ways for most situations to develop, uh, to produce babies that are genetically related to the parents but don't carry the disease, such as pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So despite all the fuss and all the talk, um, we are still in a situation where I don't believe germline editing is going to move forward anytime soon. So that's, I'm happy to answer any questions or, on those or any other areas. I just wanted to end you know, I've, I've, I have been around quite a long time. I came to Canada in 1977, uh, and I've had a wonderful career in science in Canada. My research lab is gradually closing down, but I've got such a great job myself now as head of the Gardner Foundation. So what gets me up in the morning? This is the most exciting time ever in biomedical research. Great technologies to address fundamental problems, and as a scientist, the thrill of discovery just never goes away. But also, we're seeing clinical impact of everything that we're doing in cancer, gen genomics, stem cell research. It's a great job being at the Gardner Foundation, celebrating excellence and engaging the next gen. And I really enjoy the opportunities to pass on the excitement of science to the public and to students. And I do feel, personally, and I think all scientists, have a responsibility to discuss ethical issues as they arise and help to find the boundaries. So it all begins and ends with the blastocyst. Thank you. Well, virtual applause, loud, loud, loud applause, calm applause down. Janet, that was an outstanding uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe you satisfy the scientists in the room and the non-scientists in the room. So that was uh, absolutely outstanding. Um, I can't see the crowd, but they're out there. And I'll remind them that we're not having uh, a verbal Q&A. Uh, so please use the Q&A function. Uh, you'll see that on the bottom uh, of your Zoom screen. Uh, there will be a little Q&A uh, button. Click on that and put your question into the Q&A chat. I will read it uh, to Dr. Roussant, and she will give us undoubtedly an excellent answer. Uh, Rick Austin uh, fired off his question as soon as you opened your presentation, Janet. Um, Rick says, I was just an undergraduate biology student when you were a faculty member at Brock University. Could you please provide your impression of starting your research career at a smaller research-driven university uh, to the big lights of Toronto? Uh, sincerely, Richard Austin. Sure. So uh, I did start at Brock. Um, i tell you a little bit of that story. So. I uh, married a Canadian who I met in the UK, Cambridge, uh, came to Canada without a job. Um, so I, when, I'm talk, when I'm doing a, you know, the career talk to graduate students or postdocs, I always say, well, you know, this is what I did, don't do what I did. <laughs> you know, don't do that, don't get on a plane and without a job and no, no prospects. Well, I didn't, it wasn't entirely true. I had made some contacts, and I'd made some contacts actually with Brock University because my husband was working at Mac, Mac at the time. Uh, and uh, Brock had a one-year sabbatical replacement position available, which they were just desperate to fill. I think I walked through the door and they said, you have the job. So I had a job for a year, um, and I had to translate in that one year. I had to teach a lot. Um, because it's a lot of teaching at Brock, which was great experience. I would say that doing that at a small university where you teach you know, first year biology, biology for non-scientists, cell biology, developmental biology, you learn how to present to an audience because <laughs> if you don't hold them, you're in trouble. Uh, so that was great experience. 
But I made a definite effort while I was there to network to other universities around. So McMaster, um, David Clark, who I think is on the call today, uh, and but perhaps more importantly, even to Roswell Park Memorial Institute in Buffalo, where, where there were other mouse geneticists, uh, Vern Chapman, uh, Ken Pagan was there. We had a lot of close collaboration. So that networking meant that I could be in a small university, but have a broader scope. So I think that's very important and it's important for anyone who's working in a small environment. You can get sucked in to being only in that small environment. You have to take the opportunity to network. So I did. And then I was quite happy at, uh, at uh, Brock because my one year became a tenure stream. I got tenure. I was there doing well. I got a Stacy Fellowship, so I didn't have to teach quite so much. And then one day, the chair of the biology department came into my office and said, Janet, you're doing so well, you could be the next dean. At which point, I thought, you know what? I don't think I'm ready for that just yet. I was, you know, in my 30s. Um, so that's the point at which I did decide that to some degree I had to take a chance and step out from the small environment into the bigger environment of Toronto. So I did look and start to explore opportunities to move to Toronto, giving up tenure, going to a non-tenured position, but into a fully research environment just to see, to test myself as to whether I could really make it. And it all turned out all right. <laughs> so it was a great experience. I don't regret being at Brock one little bit. I was able to do research. I had great students, undergraduates, um, master's students, I had great connections around the place and a, and a very friendly and wonderful environment. Excellent, thank you, Janet, that was great. Jerry Wright asks, or Jerry Wright states that Janet, this was outstanding. He asks, I'm curious to know where you feel small molecules rather than biologics might be feasibly applied in manipulating cellular development and if these could be drugs someday. So, so what was the, what I've got to see the question. He, he's wondering if instead of using CRISPR-Cas9, could you use chemical biology? To oh. achieve um, and could you make drugs from yeah. that? Well, yes, yes, the answer is yes. Um, and of course, uh, in terms of experimental tools, Many of the things that people do with early embryos, I talked about genetic manipulation, because I'm a geneticist, I like to knock out the genes, I like to get in there and do that. But of course, we also use a lot of small molecules to um, manipulate particularly signaling pathways in the early embryo and so on. So yes, and in fact, one of the things that uh, Nicola Rivron uh, is really pushing the blastoise system is exactly that. He wants to be able to grow it, to develop it into a system where he could you know, plate it out in 384 wells or whatever and really test different small molecules to address the pathways that specify cell fate, but also potentially pathways that would in, uh, interfere, particularly with the trophoblast, which is really, really important for implantation because the biggest problem in, early, in human early pregnancy is, is pregnancy loss around implantation which is related to trophoblast problems. So you could imagine this, using this to develop drugs that might have an impact that could help uh, early, early pregnancy. Uh, and then he also, it's also possible to think about using them for toxicity studies as well, because a lot of drugs you want to test is whether they're teratogenic. So again, these stem cell models would be a great way of potentially doing that. Great. Roger Jacobs notes that it is interesting that the 2020 guidance on gene editing is not yet, not, not never. Oh, sorry, I'm curious moving. Yes. Um, have agencies at the NAS Royal Society level drawn lines about what goals should never be approached? And he points out like super athletes. Yes, yes they have. Both the, uh, the original discussion, the first NAS report, many other reports since, and the, and the one that's just come out, really put a, dry, a red line across uh, enhancement, any situation where you'd use germline editing for enhancement purposes. And that would certainly include athletes. The question is, where, is, in, is it an enhancement if you were to uh, manipulate the allelic expression of APOE, for example? So you would take it from the one that predisposes to Alzheimer's to one that doesn't. Is that 
an enhancement. Given the safety and the efficacy and everything else, there's no way you would think about doing that. Just it would be non-feasible, very expensive, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But as a thought process, is that an enhancement or is that a a, a genetic cure, if you like, a genetic what's the other word? Not enhancement, anyway. But so I think that's that's one of the issues. Um, the in terms of even the kinds of diseases that should be addressed with this approach, uh, the last report and the previous ones, but the last report has been more specific on which kind of diseases should be, if anything happens, which should be the first to go. And they have proposed that it should only be those for which there is no alternative. That is to say, you couldn't do PGD. And that would be if you were homozygous, for a dominant mutation, so something like uh, Huntington's. Occasionally, rare people are homozygous for the Huntington's disease if they, their offspring uh, would all carry the dominant mutation for Huntington's. So that would be one. Uh, if you were homozygous, um, two homozygotes for a recessive disease, such as cystic fibrosis, for example, were to marry, that would be the same thing. You might say, well, that's very unlikely. I would say, well, you know what? We're getting better at treating people with cystic fibrosis. And they're usually in clinics, in hospitals. And who are they going to meet? <laughs> they're going to meet other people with cystic fibrosis. So it's not entirely out of the question. So they, they propose that it really should be restricted to those. But in the end of the day, they laid out a very complex pathway that you'd have to get to before you could even think about doing it there. And I would add on to that another sort of ethical moral concern that I would have and other people that shared uh, that is that this is this is a first world problem this is going to be only available if ever to those few people in clinics uh, where they can afford it because this is not going to be easy or cheap uh, and so the, there is a real question of equity issues that I think come into play as well John, you know, just just building on that, uh, I'm going to interject my own question. Um, you know, the threat of the ethics around totipotency currently, I guess, are largely hypothetical because it can't be achieved. Nothing that we thought can't be achieved has ever been not achieved mm -hmm. in a matter of time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in the context of your last comments, uh, I wonder once totipotency is achieved, and we begin to see uh, people manufacturing totipotent cells because that's inevitable. Will it remain uh, a developed nation problem or will it begin to infiltrate to a broader community? And beyond that, how do we control it at that point? Because anyone, anyone can do it, right? I mean, that's right no. now, a select few, but, but by then. No, I, th I think there are futures um, that we have not fully explored. Uh, even as scientists at this, at this point. And certainly that, that is one of them. Can you actually make stem cells that would be good enough to generate a functional, a viable embryo? It will be extremely hard because stem cells, remember, are growing, growing in culture, they're going to have epigenetic changes, imprinting changes, all sorts of things. But it's not impossible. And the last thing, that, that, but I would say more to the point, is the last one I put on my list, which I didn't talk about, which is generating gametes from stem cells. So if you generate stem cell, if you take an embryo and try to make it out of stem cells, it may be a little tricky because you've got it, all three cell types have got to work and it's, you know, it's going to be a long time to make that work. But in the mouse, you can generate viable gametes from embryonic stem cells, uh, both uh, sperm or spermatids that can be used for ICSI and injected into eggs, and functional oocytes that can be fertilized. Uh, it's not been done yet in the human, but as you just said, if it hasn't been done doesn't mean it can't be done, and in fact there's no theoretical reason why it's not possible in humans. Again, the pathways, the genetic pathways, are a bit different between mouse and human, so it's, um, you know, it's going to take some time. But now, then you have the situation of being able to gen really generate an embryo from stem cells. You can have, you can make all, you can, you know, the, the, the opportunities are endless. And also now, if you want to think about germline editing, this is the way to do it. 
because now your stem cell, your induced pluripotent stem cell from you know, one parent and the other, the one that carries the mutation, you can correct it with CRISPR and you can grow up the cells and make sure that there are no other mutations and the mutation is correct and everything is hunky-dory. You don't have to worry about just doing it in a tiny embryo. Then you make the, the gametes and you make the embryo. So this is again, it's, it's not here today, but if you think about it theoretically, there's, there's no intrinsic barrier to moving that forward. Um, and that is truly going to change human reproduction. To your, to your point, I think it's, it's going to make uh, uh, big changes in how human reproduction occurs in the next 50 years. Mm. I have some additional questions for you, how that relates to research funding, but I will first move on to other questions from the, uh, from the audience. David Clark asks, will CRISPR-Cas9 editing of the genes for malignant narcissism be ethical or unethical? And I think well, well, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, if we knew the genes, it would be, uh, would be a wonderful experiment, wouldn't it? But uh, unfortunately, we, we probably don't know the genes, at least not enough of them to be able to do it properly. Lori Burroughs says, thank you for that fascinating lecture. Besides cystic fibrosis, which diseases do you think can be most easily tackled using stem cell-based approaches? How do we avoid unanticipated consequences? And do we try to target only certain tissues? So, I th I th so are we talking now about somatic gene therapy? Because um, I say CF would not be a good candidate really for germline editing. And we've talked about that one. Let's talk about somatic gene therapy a bit. And certainly for somatic gene therapy, cystic fibrosis is a good uh, target. And the idea in CF, obviously, would be to introduce the uh, gene editing components into the airway directly. Uh, in some diseases, you want to take uh, hematopoietic cells out and fix them. So uh, the biggest targets that I think are really important for somatic gene therapy that CRISPR can do that couldn't be done other ways are um, beta thalassemia and sickle cell anemia. And those, there are trials underway right now with sickle cell, uh, for, for those with, with uh, CRISPR approaches. And what's really nice about those, to my point about the sort of global issues, is that those are huge global disease issues. And so the um, Gates Foundation and NIH have actually put millions of dollars into a, a program to develop CRISPR approaches that could be cheap enough to deliver globally. And again, can't be done the way things people are doing it now, but I could certainly envisage miniaturizing the, the CRISPR approaches in the nanosphere or whatever that you could inject and it would hit enough cells. You don't have to hit every cell, hit enough cells to, to cause um, some alleviation of disease. So there's some really great opportunities out there. Um, thank you, Jen. Karen Mossman, also thanks for your talk and for your leadership in research and now the Gardner Foundation. Uh, she'd like to hear your thoughts on public engagement, particularly around ethical issues, such as the ones discussed today. There are certain factions of the population who mistrust science and scientists. That's true, very much so nowadays, it seems. And these issues can become political and destructive. How much information do you feel the public should be made aware of and in what format? Yeah, so this is, this is the tough question, I, th I think. I, I would say absolutely uh, public engagement is important. I don't think any of us have really worked out the best way to undertake public engagement in a way that uh, engages um, with information, but also helps the public realize the limitations of what is available and that in fact scientists themselves are taking on these issues and scientists are not rushing into the field to undertake any of the things I've talked about today. They're thinking about it very, very carefully. And every step of the way, we need the public to understand where the science is, but also help us, the scientists, work out what, is a, uh, what society is really willing and able to, um, to undertake. So it's a two-way process. Nobody has come up, I would say, with the right way. Um, again, no, we're about to try and take this on to some degree because there is not just in this in the areas I'm interested in, there's so much misinformation, there's so much, as you say, distrust of science that we want to be able to 
be more of a trusted voice for science. So we're trying to think about developing uh, web pages, a web page where we could really have people ask their questions and we would send their questions to the right people. Uh, and at least we would have some way of providing uh, validated scientific information. But when you get into the ethical issues, it's a very complicated uh, discussion for sure. I've done quite a lot of public lectures and public debates in, this, in these areas. And I have to say that on the whole, the public is interested in what we're doing and is not, certainly not in Canada, incredibly, um, I've never run into real problems where people are just you know, shouting you down because this is, you know, they're so um, appalled by what's going on. But I think there is a point at which if you describe what's happening and do it carefully enough and show that you're there to present and to discuss and to help them understand it, that you're not trying to you know, do weird and wonderful things in, in the back rooms, then I think generally speaking, people get it. But that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, very good point. Um, I guess what I ask you, Janet, is where do you see the funding bodies as being uh, involved? Arguably, they are the nexus between the public and the scientists because, of course, it's public money that they are putting into science. Where do you think CIHR should be standing on these issues in terms of how they communicate what we do back to the public? As an example. That's a, I mean, that's a good question. I think obviously funding agencies have a role. I, I believe that scientists themselves have, have carry the main, should carry the main role, which of course can be done through CIHR. I don't, I don't think we should you know, go outside of that. I mean, CIHR has its uh, institutes, has its public relations, has its informational channels that we can certainly engage with. But I think scientists have to stand up and be counted. Fair enough. So Mark Lache is again thanking you for an outstanding talk and he's picking up on your comments regarding somatic cell uh, uh, gene editing. Uh, in this case, asking about stem cells for autologous transplantation and the regulatory issues around that. Yeah, so, so the regulatory issues around, around that are really no different from um, uh, existing gene therapy regulations. Um, so in fact, the, the, you have, it's the usual in Canada, it's Health Canada and everything else you have to go through. Um, so I think that uh, somatic gene editing has some concerns because, but more on the, again, um, making sure that the edits that have been done are only to the cell, to the gene of interest. So there are some sort of safety issues, um, but they, they're encompassed under the normal uh, approval processes for, for any other kind of uh, gene therapy. Um, and that also, when we, the first working group that I was on at the NAS, we, we included somatic gene uh, editing and looked into all of that and basically came out with the understanding that, you know, the FDA would deal with it in the States, Health Canada, uh, it falls under that, that heading. And, and the last question from the audience, uh, it was from uh, Matt Miller, who again, thanks you for outstanding presentation and asks if you could expand on your thoughts, experiences around challenges associated uh, with differing ethical values globally and how they might influence challenge and regulatory frameworks for embryonic gene editing. Yeah, you know, I think interestingly, for embryonic gene editing, I think there's a pretty consistent um, uh, values around, around the world. Um, there is no jurisdiction that is ready to uh, do gene editing. Many jurisdictions have limitations already in place that were put in place before we could do gene editing. <laughs> um, so they were there because there were concerns a long time ago. As soon as we made transgenic mice, sorry, the mice did it again. Uh, as soon as we made transgenic mice, people started talking about uh, transgenic humans. So there's a lot of background on this. In Canada, it is, legally prohibited to genetically um, uh, edit a human embryo, uh, even in culture. So even if you just wanted to do it on an embryo in culture to understand, you know, the role of HIPPO signaling or FGF or whatever, it's against the law in, in Canada. Um, but even well, even as countries like China, which doesn't have a law, or the US, which also does not have a law, um, there are plenty of 
other regulatory frameworks that are basically still uh, all in all agreeing to block gene germline gene editing. So when um, uh, Dr. Ho went ahead, I don't know what he was thinking of because you know China too has regulatory uh, 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 guidelines on this. It's not as though China, which people often say, oh, of course it happened in China. It could have happened anywhere because there are always going to be rogue characters in uh, the US and in Canada. Um, you know, reproductive technology clinics are not always as well regulated as they could be. It could have happened here, happened in China. But the overall agreement is pretty strong worldwide. There's less uh, agreement around human embryo research directly. So we didn't really talk about that, but growing human embryos in culture, doing gene editing to study early development, all of that, and making these uh, stem cell based embryo models. Uh, in the UK, it's okay. In the US, it's really controversial. The right to life groups are so strong and so politically strong that that can really influence the, the uh, guidelines. So it's, that's a very complicated area. But actually, I think German editing is pretty good agreement. So, so Janet, I'll ask you just one last question uh, that I guess has occurred to me over the course of listening to your presentation and the questions. And I wonder, are there some research questions that just shouldn't be asked? Like, are, it, it, are there any questions that are just one step too far because the answer will unlock that Pandora's box? And so I'm just wondering your thoughts on that. Is there a place where we just draw the line and say, you know what, you can't do that experiment? Good question, <laughs> which has been discussed many times. Some of my lawyer legal <laughs> friends um, actually are the ones who would say we should, nothing should be prohibited. It, we should not block research, we should let research go, but make, you know, keep a careful watch on it and consider the, the uh, implications as they arise. And I'm not a supporter of that approach. Uh, I think there are situations in which prohibitions are necessary. Um, prohibiting cloning, human cloning, Again, pretty well unanimous worldwide that that is something, that's a step too far. But the research to get to that point, of course, was not designed to clone humans and had its own good rationale, particularly Dolly the sheep, it was to really make genetically modified farm animals and still used that way. Um, so it's very hard, almost impossible it seems, to, when you start down a pathway, to know that this is going to turn into something that will have concerns. But it's very important as a scientist working in those sort of areas, and I say for, for me too, all the way through, you think about it, you, you have to keep aware of that. But it's hard to say stop at the beginning. Would we have stopped John Gurdon cloning frogs because that's where it began? No. John would never have thought about applying for a, a permission to do his experiments, you know. So that, that's a tough one. It's really a tough one. Well, that was a great answer. Thank you, Janet. Um, and thank you for everything. I, I think that's been a wonderful talk, incredibly uh, thought provoking, uh, very, very uh, exciting for all of us who are scientists in the area. Um, again, if you were live, there would be uproarious applause at this point. Um, so just we'll have to imagine it until I get a laugh track built into my. <laughs> uh, and again, on behalf of McMaster University, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been wonderful, Janet. I wish you all the best. It's been a pleasure. And on behalf of the Gairdner Foundation, it's wonderful to see this Gairdner Week. Please sign in to listen to the Laureate Lectures uh, later this week on uh, Thursday and Friday. You have to register, but please go to our website and do so. Uh, our Laureates are currently traveling across the country like I'm traveling to Hamilton. They're all over the place virtually. Um, but they'll all be gathering virtually uh, in Toronto, as it were, on Thursday and Friday. So please join us then. Sounds wonderful. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.